side, right? They're, they're, in, they're making cuts on an animal that still looks very much like a live creature. So the effect of the segregation that's motivated ostensibly by food safety is also, is also to experientially segregate the work of killing in ways that allow for the segregation and sequestration of the confrontation with an animal to a small subset of people, right? So that's one example. The other example I want to briefly give is in terms of how the killing itself takes place. The slaughterhouse that I worked in employed over 800 people. Of that number, only seven individual humans had live contact with the live cattle while they were still alive. And only four dealt directly with the work of killing itself. So those four workers are known as the knocker, um, the indexer, the pre-sticker, and the sticker. Okay, the knocker is the individual whose job it is to stand and for 9 or 10 hours every day at the rate of 1 every 12 seconds, shoot a captive bolt steel gun into the forehead of each cow or heifer or steer that's coming through um, the line. The, the indexer it spaces these animals after they've been shot and hung from their hind legs on an overhead rail. And then the pre-sticker and the sticker open the neck of the animal and sever the carotid um, arteries and jugular veins. To, to bleed the animal out. So already we see a massive segregation and sequestration of the actual work of killing into only a handful of individuals out of a total workforce of over 800. But what's fascinating is even the work of killing itself among those four individuals is spatially fragmented. So the knocker stands in one location right when the cattle are entering the kill floor. After he shoots the animals, they're hung from their hind legs and they're taken via overhead rail through a series of 90 degree turns that puts them behind a floor to ceiling wall and takes them out of his line of sight where the pre sticker and the sticker do their job. So what, what's happening here is that literally the work of killing is dislocated. There is no location that can be pointed to where the moment or the blow that inflicts death occurs, especially experientially for the workers, right? It's completely dislocated physically, but also experientially and morally. So these massive repetitive processes of killing are enabled by divisions of labor and divisions of structure that allow for the fragmentation of experiential and moral responsibility. Okay, that's what allows for, that's what creates the paradox, right? of workers reacting with horror when they see the Omaha police shooting an animal unmediated in front of their eyes versus the ability to go and participate day in and day out in the killing of over 2,500 of these creatures um, every day. The third and final thing I want to point to is the use of language in the slaughterhouse as one of the things that enables um, the partitioning or segregation of the experience of killing. So, one, one way that I'll illustrate this is to talk about my time working in the chutes as a live cattle driver. Um, during this time, animals, cattle would inevitably slip and fall in the chutes because the chutes are covered um, in fecal material and diarrhea and vomit, right? The animals are weak from having been transported um, long distances in some cases on trucks before they get to the slaughterhouse. So animals would fall down in the chutes. How would this be dealt with? Well, Someone would get on the radio and say, Mayday, we have a beef down in the chutes. So you already see that even while the animals are still sentient creatures, they're already being conceptualized and thought of and referred to in terms of the end product that they're going to be, right? There's a beef down in the chutes, not there's this particular individual heifer or steer or cow that slipped and fell in the chutes. The other way I'll illustrate this is with a quick story. Um, and then I'll end, and, and we can take uh, questions. I think we're going to hold questions while everyone's done. So, um, while I was working as quality control worker, I had access to all of the radio communications between plant managers um, and quality control workers. And one day, um, I was walking uh, on the kill floor, and a voice came up over the radio to report that one of the cows um, was giving birth in the pen. And literally, uh, this was reported as one of the cows that's supposed to come in and die right now is giving birth. And the USDA won't let us have it until the afterbirth passes. And this created a kind of conflict for the managers in the kill floor because um, the animals are designated to be killed in lots, together in lots that signify their point of origin. So the fact that this cow was giving birth was disrupting kind of 
the view of these animals as raw material. Now what ended up happening is this cow became the last animal on that day to be killed, um, number 2,493. And there was no word at all about the fate of the newborn calf, right? But notice the language that was used even in reporting about, um, about what happened here. This cow is supposed to come in to die, right? That is very passive language. There's no sort of um, recognition of an active sort of, you know, violence or force that's being applied to take the life of this animal. So through the division of space, through the fragmentation of the site of killing itself, and through the use of language, euphemistic language, we see ways in which massive participation in regular day in and day out processes of violence, of the killing of sentient creatures is enabled. And this is something that I look at uh, microscopically in terms of the kill floor itself, but it's also something that I challenge uh, the, my readers to think about as it applies to society as a whole as well. Right? What does it mean for all of us, uh, particularly for those who actively consume um, the, the dead flesh of other animals, to be participating in processes that are kept out of sight and therefore out of mind in ways that allow for the avoidance of a direct um, confrontation with the work of violence that's taking place. I had, a, I had an argument with a friend of mine at the end of my field work over who was more morally responsible for the work of killing. The workers in the kill floor, the, the 200 and some workers on the kill floor who directly participated in the killing of the animals, or people who eat meat, right? People who eat meat outside of society. And she contended that it's the workers who are more directly responsible because they're the ones who are doing the physical actions that are, that are taking the lives of these sentient creatures. And I, of course, pushed back and said, no, I actually think it's the meat eaters who are more morally responsible, particularly in economic and social contexts like the United States, where it's those with the least amount of opportunities who take those jobs. Um, but on further reflection, I actually think this um, kind of obsession or preoccupation with moral responsibility is a kind of deflection. Because it's possible to pass on moral responsibility for an act, but it's not possible to pass on the experience of doing that act. So one of the questions that I want to ask through my work is, what might it mean for us as a society to structure political, social, and collective institutions and arrangements in ways that collapse or narrow the experiential distance rather than expanded it, right? What would happen if some of these things began to be collapsed so that the experience of violent labor isn't something that people could uh, enjoy the products of from afar, but it's something that they would have to see, hear, taste, smell, and touch um, themselves. Uh, there's a lot more, of course, in the research, and, and I look forward to your questions um, when everyone's done, and also the conversations that we can have after the panel. Thanks.
He said, so what do you think about Vic signing with the Eagles? Now that sort of caused me to freeze a little bit because it required that I sort of, I've never seen a football game in my life. So I sort of, <laughs> but you know, I mean, my ability to mail bond with him would be non-existent if he realized that I didn't like competitive sports. So, um, so I said, um, hey, so what do you think about Vic signing with the Eagles? And I said, well, interesting. And he said, you know, he said, I love the Eagles. I love watching football. He said, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to watch those people play play ball again because every time he'll come out on that field, I'll think about what that son of a bitch did with those dogs. So I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you go to those games a lot. He said, oh, I love, love football games. I said, when you're at the football games, what are you doing? Are you eating hot dogs and hamburgers? You look at me like that. He said, well, yeah, of course I'm eating hot dogs. He said, I don't like hamburgers. I, I, I love the hot dogs. He said, tell me about the hot dogs. And I said, <laughs> I said, I lose them. The animals in the hot dog had every bit as much of a hideous life and a hideous death, probably worse than Mike Vick's dog. But isn't it interesting that we all get upset? I mean, you can't go anywhere. You can't mention Michael Vick without people fulminating, foaming at the mouth, getting very upset about what Michael Vick did to his dog. What did he do? Why did what he do was what he did was wrong? Because he inflicted suffering and death on animals. And he had no justification other than the fact that he got pleasure out of it. Why did we find that so horrifying? So what? He got pleasure. He enjoyed it. What the hell is wrong with that? Why is that wrong? And the answer is, what a stupid question. It's wrong because we can't morally justify inflicting suffering and death on an animal without a good justification. And amusement and pleasure is not enough. But then the question becomes, okay, if that's true, then why aren't we all vegans? Because there is no difference. I mean, what is our reason?